Um, Ana Catarina, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's um, a real pleasure having you here. Um, I was actually hesitant that you would see or not my message. Um, but yeah, it was really cool to, to hear from you, like uh, to hear back from you and be like, yes, yes. we're going to do this. Um, so I'm going to pour you some mezcal. Oh, we're at the very last. We have another bottle, though. That's okay. That's um, probably going to be good for me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lightweight. Yeah. It's a little bit early also, but... It's true. I haven't had breakfast, so this is breakfast. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I could have, like... Oh, no, you're good. ...given you some... I don't know. It was a choice that I made, so... Okay, I'm going to have to pour... Oh, no, that might be actually... Okay. okay. Um... So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, I would like to first ask you about your tour in Mexico. Oh, Did yeah. you tour in Mexico, right? Sort of. I actually just went down to play one festival. So oh, nice. I spent about two weeks on Isla Mujeres, and I played a few times around the island. Mm. Um, and I did a lot of my own touring on the beach. Nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so special down there. Um, now, how was that, like... Was it the first time you'd you'd played in Mexico or or not really? Yeah, I've played a few like very casual things, uh, but that was the first like official my name's on the poster mm -hmm. kind of show and I got flown down for it. Um, so that it was really cool. I love traveling and I've done a lot of backpacking. Mm -hmm. And so to couple that with my career and with music was it was pretty phenomenal it's kind of like a little dream coming true so yeah nice yeah. um I also know well you were recently in Toronto for another festival a big festival over there yes I just got back a couple days ago yeah and how was you mentioned earlier you were uh staying at Airbnb with two really cute cats um how was the whole process of uh like getting there um you know getting prepared for that uh festival um you had a few rainy days mm -hmm. as well right yeah I mean if I'm being candid which I will be I had a pretty like rough weekend right before I left and mm. just feeling like everything was kind of coming crashing together um in terms of like just being overwhelmed and really stressed and there was a day where I thought maybe I would cancel the trip um mm. And I'm really glad I didn't. Mm -hmm. And it, so yeah, that was kind of just a little hurdle that I was dealing with. Like, is this worth going for? Or do I just need to like take a week off and like get ready for everything else that's happening this summer? But uh, yeah, I spent about nine days there mm -hmm. and I stayed in a really, really good area like near Kensington. It was only a couple blocks from from my shows and had a great Airbnb host and two very cuddly cute cats which mm -hmm. was really fun and yeah when I first got there it was raining which kind of matched my mood okay. and so I spent just like some time you know preparing for the fest as well as just basically lying in bed and watching um Netflix uh and then yeah it cleared up and it ended up being super sunny and a crazy busy trip just going out as much as possible and meeting people and mm. um, seeing as much music as I could outside of the festival but the the shows themselves were great I got mm. to play some like pretty iconic Toronto venues and the band that I hired out there was amazing I was like I want the best of the best and they were <laughs> so nice. that was really fun and yeah with some of these festivals that are like showcasing opportunities conferences um I mean I, I do have a lot to say about them and and I don't want to be negative so I, I won't get too deep into it I think that they can be a great experience for making connections and networking and just introducing yourself to a new city a new place but I also think that they can promise a lot to artists in terms of industry connections and Sometimes I wonder if... If that's true. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I got a lot out of the whole experience of playing and being in Toronto, but mm -hmm. the event itself, um, I think it's just repetition of continuing to do these things, but it, it was a significant investment of time and, and my money because they don't really, like, pay artists. Mm. Um, so I just 
anyways, it's something I've been thinking about. I don't want to go on too too yeah. long about it, but it, it 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 was. I'm so glad I went. Toronto was amazing, okay. and I'm really glad I did the festival. And I am excited to see where what it leads to. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, you also uh, toured a bit through the U.S. Yeah. Um, so you started to like you released your debut album October 2022, right? Yes. And then you started to like uh, build on these uh, like small small gigs, but then touring like little by little until you well you're now here. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, as if we were like the greatest. Um, but <laughs> you are the greatest. Yeah. Right. <laughs> cheers to that. Oh yeah. Cheers yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. pretty smoky nice. oh, I love it yeah I love Moscow as well yeah um so yeah you started to like gain a bunch of like momentum I feel uh into like a lot of shows and um so you did a small uh or no not actually small you did a few, uh you did play a few uh in a few places in in the U.S. and then you went to Tennessee but how was like How did you, like, get all the way to Tennessee? Was it something you were already planning to do? Or was it, like, you started to, you know, to do your tour and then you knew someone and then they were, like, you should come and do this thing? Yeah, that's a good good question. I, I feel like so much of being, being an, an artist and being in this industry, mm -hmm. same with, like, the fest I just did in Toronto, is just, like, finding one seed of an opportunity mm -hmm. and then following that and seeing where it could lead. Um, and sometimes it doesn't lead to something else, but I, I feel like usually it does, whether it's like one artist that you met to like open for them or like a festival organizer or, you know, a winery owner. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this particular trip, um, wow, I think it was like back in fall 2021, Actually, it really goes back to I went to Folk Alliance in 2020 in New Orleans. Um, oh, folk wow. Alliance is like a big folky, et cetera, conference um, similar to the one that I just did. And uh, it was right before the pandemic hit. And oh, um, my. I was with my other band, Rumor Mill. And we got booked to play a festival in Austin in 2020. Obviously, that got canceled. Mm -hmm. So it got pushed back to 2021. Um, we were still really determined to, to play. And so we went down and then from there we kind of decided to just do uh, a trip up. Um, so we started in Austin and we went up to visit my dad. He lives in North Carolina hmm. and played a show there. And then I realized like, oh, he's only five hours from Nashville. We got to go. So we we just drove out there and I think we had like one one show So it wasn't really like planned, planned. It was more like yeah, it was like you little got to seeds. place, and then you went to another place, and then it started to build up to that moment. Yeah, so we had all these like ideas, and you know, Nashville is such a music mecca, especially mm -hmm. particularly for songwriting. And um, the last time we'd been there was actually the week before the pandemic hit in 2020 in March, and it was when the tornado hit Nashville. It was a rough mm -hmm. time there. It was like tornado and then the pandemic like all kind of with within one week and so we had this like very interesting experience of seeing how the community came together and responded to yeah like, this crisis exactly and it was beautiful it was really you know so we got involved in like helping clean up after the earthquake and there's friends that we met on site that you know i were invited to their wedding in the fall wow um, so it was just such such a just a great opportunity. I mean, it was a, the circumstances were not great, obviously with, with what was happening. In, But in, allow, it allows to like, or lays the ground for making like really strong connections. Yeah. Yeah. And like, cause you're very human. vulnerable. Exactly. And I think, you know, a lot of networking opportunities and artist things, you're kind of putting this artist face on and it's your business face because we are all entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always have my business cards ready and I'm always mm -hmm. trying to like self-promote. But I think when you can meet somebody on more of a human to human level, you know, it's more impressionable and also just, you know, relationships are really what matter at the end of the day mm -hmm. anyways. And so we were able to just meet people um, regardless of the fact that we're musicians. And um, so... 
that was back in 2020. We went back in 2021 and I just had an amazing time. We were there for almost two weeks. Um, it was me, my bandmate and my boyfriend. And we just met so many amazing people and they kind of brought us into their circle. And but at the end of the, that trip, I cried because I really didn't want to leave. Mm. And I'm like, we got to we gotta move here. We're moving here. We're moving to Nashville. That's what's happening. <laughs> and so I got this idea in my head. And I also knew like coming out of the pandemic, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in BC. I am an American citizen, so mm. got to take advantage of that. And so we, uh, yeah, my boyfriend and I got a place for four months and we moved down there. And the idea was like to go down for the first half of last year and then come mm. back to BC, do some touring and then move back. Um, and so obviously I'm not living there. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it was the right fit for like a more permanent living situation, but um, it was it was really wonderful. And it led to like playing a lot of shows in the area and in Kentucky, North Carolina. And and yeah, I think like with touring and following following the opportunities, it's just you know, if it's a I coin flip, it's a coin flip. Yeah. You never know. And sometimes like you travel, you go way out of your way for a gig. That's not great. Mm. And sometimes it's the best gig you've ever played, or maybe you're playing that gig. That's not great. But there's like one person there that then leads you to your really your cool next gig. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually am like, it's, I can't talk about it too much because it's not like announced publicly yet mm -hmm. but there's a, a new festival that's gonna be happening in um near just in Salulita north of Ooh, Puerto Vallarta nice is, you know where that is <laughs> nice. and um I am gonna be playing that festival next year and that was from like I was actually just in Bucerias visiting family and mm. there was a market and there was a really great band playing so I like sent him a message because I needed to use a record something really quick while I was down there and he invited me to his home and uh then we ended up doing some video content and I sang with him first and now he's organizing this festival so I think um like that's just a great example now I'm playing a sweet festival in Mexico next year wow yeah wow I um I, I admire a lot uh that of people when they're like I'm just gonna like, I know it might sound very cheesy, but, like, the whole, like, yes attitude. It was just, like, like yeah, I'm just, it's not, like, not in a, like, motivational kind of way. Like, yes, I'm going to say yes to everything. But more as in, just going to say yes and see what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. um, because whether it might be the worst gig I've played, it can also be just, you know, something that leads me to my next big thing. Or just something that I had really a lot of fun with. Or a place where I got to feel, you know, not a businesswoman uh, and just feel me. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, or, yeah, like, feel like myself, right? So, um, so I, I, I admire when someone is very determined to their own, like, uh, to make the most out of their craft with that attitude. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and it'll definitely lead you to something, like, really really great it's been doing it so far uh Absolutely. in a very short term like period uh with regards to your solo um career um can you tell me a little bit more about your duo uh group or band that you have you still you still play uh, as a duo we like do sometimes yeah, yeah okay. we're kind of i mean so it's uh we're called rumor mill mm -hmm. we've been going under like indie folk genre but um if you listen to our stuff, it's like kind of all over the map. Uh, and my duo partner is Lynn Deanna. She also mm -hmm. has a solo project. And we go way back. Like our moms were friends before we were born. And oh, then, wow. <laughs> yeah. We went to, we graduated high school in the same year together. And we went to college together. And we've been in various musical projects. Um, I have a very special hard drive <laughs> of <laughs> things that uh, one day as embarrassing as they are, might be hopefully worth a lot of money, but, um, <laughs> that's so cool to, so she's like, she's your best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's so cool. It's really cool. Yeah. And it's, it's been like, I owe her a lot in terms of like, just, I don't know how to like describe her attitude, but of just like 
pushing you to push yeah, yeah exactly in a nice way yeah yeah in just a way that she's like like not shoving just like yeah pushing you to towards exactly like i i learned i i'm i studied like keys and um and voice and then during the pandemic i was, it was actually right before the pandemic i saw samantha samantha fish play in new orleans she's like this incredible mm. blues musician and i said i really need to learn how to play guitar for various reasons and um then so the pandemic hit and I was like perfect now I have so much time and within like two two three months of playing Ellen's like great now let's perform you're playing guitar and I was like I'm what? not I'm like- not ready and she's like you're gonna be fine I'm like no I'm not and then she's like and it's gonna be fine and then it was fine you know it wasn't like I wouldn't want to listen to that show now but I don't think I would be as good of a guitar player now if she hadn't pushed me and like for various other things, you know, um, I think like implementing risk into what you do, especially, you know, what's actually the risk in that I sound terrible and then no one cares or remembers, like, doesn't matter. It's not a big, mm. it's not like I'm a pilot. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. It's like yeah. the risk is you're not, pretty, you're not a doctor. So yeah. Um, yeah, you're not. Yeah. It's so I might as well take risks cause it's, it's not really a risk. Um, yeah, so we now that we both have solo projects, which you know I think has been really, really healthy for our, our friendship and also just like the industry, it's good to diversify. Um, we have like less time because you know we've, we're doing you're our focusing own thing on a lot. yeah, yeah. But what it's been cool because the time that we do have is is very focused. So mm. we are top secret. It's like sort of a secret, sort of not. We haven't really announced it, but we have an album coming out very soon. Ooh. And we recorded it with Murray Pulver in Winnipeg last fall. And now we're just like gathering all the pieces and getting ready for release. But it sounds really, really good. And it feels... Yeah, just like kind of an adult version of what we've done in the past. Um, and it was really great to work with just such a phenomenal producer that like Murray's whole intention is just to draw the artist out of themselves and put it onto a record. Mm-hmm. So I really feel like this record is is very us. Um, and that, you know, we made it, might attach our solo names to it as well, just to so that as many people can hear it as possible. Mm-hmm. But we will be touring a little bit this summer too and... And yeah, it's uh, you girls are very great. busy. Yeah, it, it's a lot. Like having multiple projects has, I think, equal pros and cons, mm. and it can be very overwhelming and feel like chaotic. Um, but I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it's for the best. Like we we love it, and it's so mm. this industry can be so lonely, and so to like have yeah. somebody to go through it with you and like make decisions and. It's way more fun filming a music video and going on tour with somebody else than doing it alone. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> it's like completely different. So, yeah. Oh, well, I'm I'm excited. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely listen to that uh, upcoming album. Um, and so you, well, you mentioned it a little bit um, just now. Uh, so you were first, uh, a key player. You're still a key player. Yeah. Um, how was that whole, like, when was that the first instrument you were drawn to? Was it more because do you have, uh, a musical, a musical family that started to get you into playing keys or was it just something that you were attracted to when, like whatever years ago? Um, and how long was this? Actually, like all I wanted to do was sing and play violin. That's it. Um, Mm. and from, I know this sounds cheesy and I feel like a lot of people say this, but I, from the moment I remember having a memory, like I just knew I was going to be a musician. Like that's it. Wow. And going through like, you know, grade school and high school, like I, I'm pretty academic and I got like good grades and it was almost like it didn't matter because I was like, well, it does, doesn't matter because I'm going to be a musician. I'm not going to do this. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to do it. So it was almost like this kind of like game because I was, I took it seriously, but I was also like, it was just ingrained in me. Like I'm going to be, I'm a singer and I'm going to do it, you know? And obviously at the time in my head, I was going to be like the next Taylor Swift. And now that I, and it's taken a long time to like actually understand what it means to be a musician and be a part of the industry and like remove the glamour from it. 
um, because it does look a lot more glamorous than it is. That's not to say that there, I don't have moments or I do have moments all the time where I'm like, I can't believe that this is my job. Like it's so glamorous, Mm -hmm. but for the most part, you know, it's, it's real life. It's, it's hard. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I wanted to sing, I wanted to play violin Mm -hmm. and my mom was like, we're putting you in piano. (laughs) And so I, was it because she played or? Or was it just you know like what? I'll have to ask her. I think okay, she didn't want to put me in voice lessons when I was four because your voice changes so much. Mm. And I begged and begged and she was like, I'm not gonna put money into that until yeah. you've fully developed. And we were like on welfare, like we didn't have money for mm. anything, you know. She sometimes had to decide if we we're gonna have eggs or toilet paper. And so um, she actually started teaching me piano herself. So that was probably something that factored into it is she she studied piano. And mm. that side of my family is very musical. And my grandma still sings in like three choirs. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and so then the deal became that I could take voice and violin once I graduated from grade eight conser- Royal Conservatory piano, which is mm. like – really hard <laughs> like yeah. it takes a long time you know so you started this when you were I started playing when I was four yeah so wow yeah and it was very like classical and then uh, we moved from Nelson BC to Victoria and I started taking lessons from like a very incredible teacher Jen and I you know you get up to the point where you're practicing an hour and a half a day and I was rigorous with myself you know like I was like I didn't I, I was thinking about this recently I would often practice when I came home from school and no one was home and then mom would be like, did you practice for an hour and a half? And I'd always, always say yes. Mm -hmm. And like, I never lied, which is kind of amazing. Like I never even considered it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Yeah. I could have been like, yeah. Or like practice for like an hour, but no, I would like set a timer and like, I wouldn't short myself even a minute. Like, wow, what a strange kid. But, um, I think I'm thankful to that now. Um, eventually I think I was like grade five she did let me take fiddle and I should have stuck. I wish I'd stuck with it a bit longer because with violin, like you, if you don't get to a certain level, like you just pretty much sound awful. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still, I'm like, every time I pick it up, I'm like, wow, this is awful. So I don't want to practice, but um, it's something I've been picking up a little bit more this year. Okay. It's like not something I need to like do professionally, but it's just a fun instrument that I really love to play. Um, and then voice, I think I started in grade eight and, um, that was something like I didn't have to force myself to practice. I just loved it so Mm -hmm. much. And I still, I love practicing singing. Um, and then I went to jazz school after, um, you went to Berkeley and you went to, yeah, uh, school. Oh, Selkirk. Selkirk. Yeah. Yeah. So I did my like two year program, got my, um, diploma at Selkirk and then I transferred to Berkeley and that was a really cool experience and I dropped out because all of the you know successful musicians do that (laughs) (laughs) obviously it was totally according to plan um but no that was actually really hard because I dropped out of college and I was like okay now you know that was my that was my route to being successful you know Mm. which is completely unrealistic you don't graduate from college and then all of a sudden have a successful music career that's not how it works but not even like in any career like in, yeah in no career you yeah. know and I remember I was like I was 21 and I just felt like such a failure and I moved back in with my mom for a bit and I was just like oh I'm so embarrassed I'm living with my mom and mm. all I don't know what I'm doing with my life and I struggled a lot with like panic episodes and depression and and now I look back you know and I, I was like right now I'm living with my boyfriend's parents and I don't feel embarrassed or ashamed, you know, I'm like, sweet, (laughs) this is (laughs) helping me uh, save some money. But at the time it was, it was really challenging. Um, and then a few years later I went back to Selkirk and did a third year. Um, that was just more for fun. And I took more like keyboard classes and performance based classes Mm. and just joined some more local bands. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, my background with, with those instruments. A lot, a lot to, to go through. Did you, so you mentioned like you were, um, one of those kids that was like, I'm just, I'm, I know I'm going to be a musician. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then 
like you started to you mentioned also you were always like along with your your best friend and you were like doing these um I don't know like small gigs or like playing and um but so when you got to the point when you were like okay okay I'm gonna study music Mm -hmm. and you went to Selkirk and then you decided to go to Berkeley um was there like when you dropped out was it because like did you have or go through a moment of like self-doubt uh like do I really want to be a musician can I really like go through this or was it more like this is just like this place is just not for me like I'm gonna do it I'm just not gonna do it it was more of a realization of like this is not the route that I want for me like I I I can do whatever else uh and still achieve what I want yeah I it was definitely not the first like I knew that being a musician was the only option um you know, now I realize, you know, it's, it isn't the only option. And I, I think I could be happy doing something else because it's not the be all and end all. I mean, I say that, but do I believe it? I don't know. But, um, (laughs) it was more like I, it remains a question to be. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm like not about to quit now. So I, I was really struggling with depression and like, um, yeah, I don't know how much to talk about this. It is something that I, I'm passionate about talking about, but and I'm still even just, like, figuring out how to explain it, but I would have, and sometimes I do still have. This is actually what happened before going to Toronto and why I almost canceled my trip. But, like, these pretty, these very, very, very intense, horrible panic episodes that last mm-hmm. for, like, days, and it just it's kind of like my brain gets stuck in just fear response and I just feel like I'm going to die. Like it's, uh, yeah, it's horrible. I don't, I won't dwell on it. Um, but I am very passionate about just mental health and like finding balance and, um, supporting each other because when I'm in an episode, like nothing else matters except for just the people that I care about Mm -hmm. and the fact that I have a support system, like, which is so important because you so might important. not see it in that moment when you're going through that. Uh, but then when you don't have it, you see. I think I would die if I didn't have it, like mm. going through that and not having like my mom was such a huge pillar, like really through that time in my life. Um, and and even now and like my partner and it's yeah, I have so much compassion for people that don't feel like they have people that they can lean on in those circumstances mm-hmm. and just feel safe because mm-hmm. it's it's Super horrible important. anyways but uh, yeah it's so that was kind of like starting to happen and you know I've there's various reasons for it and I've done a lot of work with health and nutrition and fitness and mm-hmm. just diving into physiology um as well as therapy yeah, like mind hacks <laughs> yeah and just like I you know um I should go on like a health podcast too because I have a lot to say about this <laughs> subject and just like balance within your body and like minerals and um, neurotransmitters and medication and supplements, whatever, whatever. But that was really starting to affect me to the point where like I couldn't go to class and mm. I didn't – I did make some great friends there that I still actually keep in touch with and are, are wonderful, but I didn't have the support of like my family that I needed mm. at that time. Um And then I entered Berkeley kind of naively in terms of like, this will fix it. Like this will make me feel better. Yeah. And, and like, this will give me the direction that I need in order to be successful or, and I didn't, I had like very low self-confidence and it's, it's something like I, you know, I still struggle with. And, but at that time it, it was like, I was so fragile and I didn't know like what, steps to take to pursue what I wanted you know Mm I I was really struggling with like writing songs and performing and like the idea of like working with other people like terrified me and then when it came time to like choosing my major I was like I don't know I just want to be like Taylor Swift you know (laughs) but I was like way too self like deprecating and like insecure to like choose performance as a major and I also think that that's kind of a useless major and a total waste of money and time in my opinion I think like if you want to be a performance major just go out and perform but um so I was like and I 
you know, like sometimes you in life you make a decision and there's all these roadblocks mm-hmm. that start popping up and it kind of makes you feel like, okay, I think that's not the path for me. And then sometimes when you make a decision, like all these things fall into place and you just feel like, Oh, you're... this is where I should be walking exactly. towards to. Yeah. So that, that really happened to me there where I got to, to Boston and everything was hard. Like from buying, I needed to buy like a PA system and a keyboard and even like a cable and like it was so heavy to bring all this stuff to my apartment. And then I get there and it didn't work or, uh, like signing up for classes. Um, I had to get a blood test before I left Canada to prove that I'd already had the chicken box. And like, because it was Labor Day weekend and all this stuff, like Berkeley was still waiting for my doctor to send them the proof that I'd had the chicken box. (laughs) And so they wouldn't let me register for any classes until they got that. So, so you registered late. Like. Yeah. So I was like there, but then classes were starting and I was, I had no classes. I couldn't pick a voice teacher. So I got like the last pick of everything and it just felt shitty because I was like, I'm spending a lot of money to be here and like without this, actually, what am I getting out of getting it? Out of it. Yeah. And especially coming from the program that I'd done before where I had so much one-on-one attention from all of the instructors and performance opportunities. It's, you know, it's a very small school in a small city. It just felt stupid to be there. So, and then I came, you know, it came to a point where I was like, okay, I'm like going through all of this mental health and like emotional stuff. That's horrible. And like, I, I don't have the capacity to put any energy into my classes. And then do I even want to put energy into my classes? Cause these aren't the ones that I wanted anyways. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And then just all these other like weird roadblocks started popping up and I just was like, I think I'm trying to force this and it's not right for me. Mm -hmm. And I think I just need to go home and take a breather and then figure out, okay, what else is there? And I think a lot of kids don't, you know, they struggle like when they get out of the system because we're put in school and we're like four or five and then, all of a sudden you're in your early twenties and you're supposed to like be no, a human yeah. in the real world and not have like a schedule or be a part of an institution. And I was like, I was really dreading that. Like I didn't, I was like, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to know what to do with myself. And it was, it was a challenging adjustment, but I'm glad I did it. Cause like, like, what do I put my timer to? Yeah. Like, and who's, who cares about me? Like who's, who's going to grade me on like this thing that I did or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. And I really, would not want to be that age again <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> um I was uh hard on me with hard on myself uh I played a lot of sports when I was younger um and I was very hard on myself when it came to sports so my parents didn't really have to like push me to go to practice I would be like you're already there like yeah like what do you mean so yeah. Um, and if I would finish practice, I would also have this like, um, oh, there's another, like another hour we are going to, I don't have anything else to do. So I'm just going to stay here for another hour and, and practice whatever. Um, so yeah, it was, for me, it was like my transition was a little bit hard, uh, because after junior high into high school, there was no like sports team in my high school. Like, Ugh. yeah. And it was like, what? what am I supposed to do now? Like, and what do, what do I do in my afternoons? Like, I don't, I don't know. It was weird. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I understand that whole like moment of like, well what now who's going to, yeah. What do I do? I have um, a lot of compassion for people that do sports and like my sister is a dancer and at least with music, there's so much you can do on your own, which can also be hard because it can be lonely, but like with, with stuff that involves a team, yeah. like acting you know like it's really challenging to just do that alone on your own like I can imagine how weird that is because you can't just like always make it happen or just like go out and do it alone yeah I it's mean hard. you sort of do it well it, well it depends on the sport I guess right. um like for I mean football was more like meh. I, I sort of need someone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but basketball, uh, I could 
yeah, I could just like, or I would go with my sister because she's she's older than me, um, and we would just go and you know just throw some hoops. Um, she was always better than me <laughs> in basketball. I was better than her in, in football. Um, but yeah, which is weird because uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I guess it's it, there. There is a moment when you realize like I need. Um, like I need the support of having things timed and evaluated and like somehow validated by an, a higher authority and uh, no one tells you like that's gonna that's gonna stop once you finish school but then you sort of get it again when you get a job and you're a normie and what about know. when you're self-employed but where <laughs> if you're self-employed and that's what you want to do yeah, yeah then that it changes because it's like now how do I how do I be my own boss? Yeah. How do you like validate yourself and hold yourself accountable? If you did or you didn't do. Yeah. Whatever. And, and also like the positives as well as of just like celebrating success. And I don't always believe in like, oh, I did that thing. So I'm going to buy myself a pair of like Lululemons. Mm. But I but I also do believe in that. Um, maybe not always monetary, but like I think you know, no one's giving you raises, no one's giving you bonuses yeah. or pats on the back. So how do you implement that into your own work flow work? and like, exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, sometimes it's like, just take a whole weekend, like two days in a row off where you don't touch your instruments or your computer or like <laughs> get a massage or I think that's just so important. And it's something that we don't think about and talk about. Self-care. Yeah. Yeah. Self-care. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's but true. In a way that's not like, better yourself <laughs> or privileged yeah. yeah like a way that's just like nice and normal like I don't know stuff that we take for granted sometimes like just yeah yeah sleeping in on a Sunday yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's easy to do it's free and, and nice and nice yeah 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 and you can brunch and whatever <laughs> yeah. um did you um I I don't know how your writing process is like mm -hmm. how do you make your own music but um I can imagine you can uh get inspiration or draw inspiration from different places and moments in time and emotional mm -hmm. uh you know times as well um do you have uh any like music that you made while you were going through this or was it more like I actually couldn't do anything I was more like paralyzed and then after you mentioned it a little bit earlier um, and then, but then afterwards, it was like this big burst of creativity that just fell into place once I decided that this is this isn't where I want it to be, mm -hmm. and uh, I found a better path for my own, you know, goal. Yeah, I mean, I was absolutely paralyzed, and I won't lie; like, it's not like I came back from Berkeley and I was fine. It was years of working with doctors and um, just self-regulating and just figuring out like what was going on in my body and my mind. Because like what was what was happening, what still sometimes happens is like it's not a normal response. It's, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was like paralyzed in fear for a, and the, just this this state. Um, I don't even know what to call it uh, for for a long time and. I still push myself to like try to touch my instruments and write a little bit. And I did write a few songs during those years. Um, I also was involved in like some musical theater stuff, which was, mm. which was wonderful. Uh, but yeah, I've, I find generally with my writing process, you know, I'm not one of those like prolific songwriters that like writes a song a day or can yeah. write from nine to t nine to five in Nashville or like do is like always inspired. Um, and I think partially it's, it's just cause I'm so busy and I'm, I'm pursuing my own artistry, not just songwriting. So, you know, when I have some time that other people might have like, you know, the will to like reach for their instrument, I'm like, I just need a break and I just need to like lie out in the grass in the sun or like watch a show or read a book. Um, so I think it's partially just, just that, but I've, I've generally found more success. I don't know if success is the right word, but, um, like effective writing. Uh, yeah. Or? Effective writing or like inspired writing about situations I've been in or 
or things I've felt after the fact. Um, I, I have lately been finding that that's mm. shifting and I'm able to like write more from the place that I'm in at that moment. Um, for me, I find songwriting. So it's like reflective for you. Yeah. And like if you listen to my, the album I just released, like a lot of that is reflective and a lot of it is conversations with different people in my life or, um, and they're more specific and it's a lot, it's less, it's personal, but it's not like super internalized if that mm. makes sense mm -hmm. um the songs that i've been writing lately are a lot more like what am i feeling now and what are you know what's going on inside my head and in my heart and sometimes i find it's like i finish a song i'm like is that a good song because it's not i don't have like that distance and then sometimes i'll like put it away and then i'll bring it back out and be like oh yeah okay no that is a good song or maybe not um I find like generally, I love talking about songwriting. I think it's it's super fascinating. If, I find it comes from three different places. Mm -hmm. So I've written some songs that, and I, I try to give myself this space to just, you know, like open my the door to my heart and just mm -hmm. like let it pour out. And sometimes it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I look back and I have a song called Gracie. And I think it's one of my best songs and it just kind of like came out of nowhere and it's very like folk country-esque in that but you know there's there's some times I look back at my songs and I'm like wow that's so good that's so clever but I wasn't thinking like oh I want to write a really a good clever, clever song, song. Yeah. yeah it just kind of like came out and I think that's when people talk about like the muse you know mm. that's and it's such a cool feeling and it, it's for me like those are songs that I feel so proud of and that I can because sometimes it's hard to, you know, look at yourself and say, wow, I'm proud of myself or that mm. was, I did a really great job at that. You know, we're always looking forward. Especially if you've been hard on yourself for so long. Yeah. And yeah. I think being hard on yourself helps you grow, but it, there's a point where you need to not be hard on yourself and just acknowledge your, your strengths and what yeah. you've done. So there's like the muse and then another form of songwriting that I really enjoy. And I'm very like logical and I love math and like puzzles and that kind of thing I do a lot of crosswords um <laughs> and in school I loved composition class and often that would be weekly challenges of like okay write in like Dorian or using only two chords or write about you know your grandparents or write about or write like take a song that you really love and write something that's kind of like in a similar vibe mm -hmm. and so like rather than just being in this like super creative flow state, you're still in this creative state, but it's more of like you've created a box for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I find like, it's so. It's more like solving like yeah. problems. Yeah. yeah. Like, a, like a math problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think. A formula, like trying to develop a formula or solve a, um, a math problem. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's where like a lot of really different creative songs can come from and I think you know there's a lot of artists that I love but a lot of their music sort of is very similar to each other which isn't wrong it's just mm -hmm. for me personally like when I'm performing when I'm touring a lot like I like having a lot of variety in my sound because it's more interesting for me and I think that comes across really well especially when you're playing solo where like you don't have a ton of variety and in, like instrumentation mm -hmm. Um, and then like the third way of writing that I've been getting into more recently is co-writing. And I find the approach is kind of draws on both, but there's like this other emotional psychological component mm -hmm. because you're like bouncing ideas off another person. So there's almost this like interesting force and connection that's in the room. And like sometimes you write with somebody that has a really strong music theory background, mm -hmm. um, like I have and sometimes you write with somebody that doesn't which can be interesting because like you have to change the way that you speak and the language that you use but mm -hmm. it's also forced me to be a lot more open in terms of you know they're like what about these chords and in my mind I'm like no those chords like don't go together mm -hmm. but to just be like yeah great let's try it and then you know that might end up being like an amazing song with two chords that I never would have put together yeah or like because theoretically they don't make, make sense, sense. Uh -huh. yeah but like breaking those rules 
and pushing those boundaries. Um, yeah. So I, well, and that person probably doesn't know that yeah. they're breaking the rules. They're like, I just like it. Cause it's like, yeah, for and me, that's it's like, and what matters. Like, oh yeah. It's yeah. It could be, it can sometimes be like more honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it depends, I guess. Um, and so for you, like, do you, um, like come across first with words when you're writing or do you do first melody or sometimes it's like or it just changes it changes I I struggle with lyrics like they're they're definitely my Achilles heel mm -hmm. I I never used to listen to lyrics I'll be honest oh. like growing up like I was not a Bob Dylan fan I didn't even listen like I listened to Joni Mitchell you know because mm -hmm. my mom listened to it but I was never like, I actually still like, it's on the list of things to do is like, listen to more Joni Mitchell, just like in depth. And there's, you know, I think she's incredible now and there's mm -hmm. so much depth in her writing and her melodies. And, but all I'm trying to say is like, I just didn't listen to lyrics. Like it, I remember the first time I really resonated with a song lyrically. I think it was like 21 and it's a middle brother, middle brother or Dawes song called Million Dollar Bill. And I just thought like the lyrics were so romantic and sad and beautiful. And um, that's kind of more when I started listening. But even then, like with my writing process, like I just throw whatever words like came out and it was really mm. more of a, a mel melodic and harmonic experience for me. Um, when I graduated from college, I had a showcase and most of those songs were all mine. And I, I was taking composition classes and I wasn't taking songwriting. And so like the mm -hmm. difference at like a university level is songwriting is very lyrics first. Oh. And primarily just lyric, lyrics and like very folk kind of mm -hmm. oriented. And then composition, like we didn't even talk about lyrics. It was all about the music and that. And it's not necessarily like singer songwriter style. Always there'd be, we talk about you know, writing for film and different, different genres. Mm. And somebody came up to me after my showcase and they said, wow, like, I really like love your lyrics and can relate to them. And I had this moment of blankness where I was like, like what, what are my songs even about? <laughs> like, I like could not tell you what they're about. Like they're just, they don't mean anything to me, but I like how they sound. And, and like slowly going forward, I kind of started shifting that a little bit and trying to be a little bit more intentional because I'd have some songs that were like the verse was talking about something and then the chorus was talking about something and they like were completely different. Mm. And um, I remember I moved to Vancouver. It was 2017 and I wrote this really beautiful song and I brought it to my bandmate, Alin, and she's like, Anna, this is the best song you've ever written. It's called I Should Know Better. It's it's on our second record and it's very simple. Like there's not a lot of lyrics, which it, sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's better. And like better, for me yeah. who I kind of don't love the lyric writing process, like, you know, the, the, le the least amount of lyrics can be sometimes the best. But, and I remember thinking like, wow, it was so felt so powerful to like be able to put my feelings into words. And then now, you know, I, we still play that song and I still like sometimes tear up because it like feels like so, there's so much emotion behind those lyrics. And so, yeah. And, and now, and especially after being in Nashville in the last few years of realizing how much people like resonate with lyrics, mm. it's become much more important to me. And like, I find a lot more release in terms of it being like a creative outlet or an emotional mm. outlet for me. That being said, like, yeah, so I try to I try to write lyrics kind of at the same time, and then once I've written like a verse, then I'll often like spend time like okay, just on lyrics, and then go kind of bouncing back and forth. But if I'm doing a co-write, I often am the person that takes more of the chordal and the melodic mm -hmm. seat, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it depends. But I find to me like figuring out like a really good melody and a really good um, chord structure is like, I love it. I have totally mm. love it. And then I have, I've had songs that I haven't finished for years because I just don't have the lyrics ready, oh. you know? And I'm like, I just don't, 
I just want it to be done. And I'm in this phase where I'm like, oh, it's going to be such a good song, but like, I just don't care. And maybe at that point I should really just take it to somebody else and be like, hey, I really need to finish these lyrics and it's going to be a great song, but like, can you co finish co-writing this with me? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also been a great challenge to kind of dig in deeper. And, and I think some of my songs, for example, Golden Days, I like had the song like all written and except for the lyrics, <laughs> like, the, <laughs> like months went by and I, my recording date was getting closer and closer. And I'm like, I need to finish this song like ASAP. And now I, I really like the lyrics. I think that they, people like relate to them. Um, it seems really fun and poppy, but there is a layer of, of depth to it. And so I don't think there's any bad way to write a song. And I think we all yeah, have our strengths just... and, and weaknesses. Um, I also don't think it's bad to, to have to ask for help. I think we get into this, you know, idea of like, oh, I'm, if I'm not writing amazing songs every week and like doing it all by myself, like I'm not a true songwriter. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a meeting with Donovan Woods last year and we were talking about songwriting and he said, you know what, if I write one or two great songs a year that I want to record, that's great. Like that's, mm. that's satisfying. And he's like, that's better than, yeah, writing you know, a shitty song. 20 and then they're all like yeah. useless. Yeah. And that being said, like, I think it's good to challenge yourself too. And like right now I'm doing kind of a self accountability hmm. where I'm trying to write, you know, one song every two weeks, regardless if it's good, like just to get into the practice of a, like just sitting down and giving myself the space to write. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like making time for yourself. And then B because I, and I'm doing it with my Patreon. So there are, you know, a few people that will care or notice mm -hmm. if I don't do it, then they'll know and I'll know. Um, and so like stopping that voice that stops the song, mm -hmm. you know, cause there's always that voice that's like, that's bad. That's bad. That's shitty. Or, oh, that's good. You should save it for a different song, mm -hmm. which then ends up, you know, ruining both ideas. <laughs> so, um, just like that, I, that, yeah, so I'm just doing this accountability thing for like every two weeks for the next little while. I'm just going to write a song and it, it might be terrible. It might be the worst songs I've ever written, but at least it's I'm making practice the time. Practice makes perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Songwriting is practice. Everything in this industry is practice. Like yeah. performing is practice. Playing mm -hmm. with a band is practice. Playing solos are practice. Like doing interviews and podcasts, that takes practice. Yeah. You yep. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I could, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, you actually, so you have this uh, song you just mentioned, I think. Is oh, it, if it's the one that I am thinking of for Ellie? Mm. Ellie? Yeah. Yeah. So when I heard it, I was like, it's, so wait, so that song is for your best friend? No, no. that one I wrote for my sister. Okay. Yeah. Then I will. I wasn't, I was like, this song is either for like, I, I don't know. I feel, I, I felt like very, um, uh, like seen. Cause I was like, that's, this song is either for like her kid, like is she a mom or for her sister? Like for, so your sister's younger than you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I could, so, well, my sister is, is, uh, older than me. But I used to have these like very strong feelings whenever we would play basketball or football or whatever. If someone would hurt her, <gasps> mm. it would be like rage just inside my whole body. And I just wanted to like, you know, kick the other girl's ass or whatever. Um, I would be very protective of her, even though I was uh, younger. So when I heard the song, I was like this whole concept and idea of trying to make your like that person who you care for just not suffer at all mm -hmm. and just yeah it's a very like strong and uh I don't know how to explain but yeah very strong connection you have with someone uh and I would I would usually have that with her especially because it was the person that I would see the most to get hurt like physically while we were playing sports or you know and whatever um so when you were saying right now that you weren't really you're not really like so lyrically driven I was like, really? Because I heard that song and I was like, wow, that sounds like, because I obsess over lyrics. I'm like completely the opposite. You're opposite. Yeah, I obsess over lyrics. Uh, but it might be 
because of the fact that I'm not a musician. So I, I need to, like the way I can find myself, um, like seen or, or being able to express myself in a better way is through words and not through, you know, um, yeah, not through music. So that might be it, you know? Okay. Um, but that song is really is so beautiful. Like Thank I, you. I was like, wow, that song is really touching. Like, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you something. I wrote that was like the first song that I wrote, like the first like adult song. I wrote that when I was seventeen. Oh wow! Which was not recently, and I wrote, and I think. Did your sister cry when she? Heard it? <laughs> I mean, she was like five <laughs> at the time. So yeah, it, so it's kind of a. So she was just like, oh yeah, nice song. Thank yeah. You. But I think she she recognized it and it like lived on this, you know, iPod mini. Mm, yeah. We still have it. Like it, <laughs> I recorded it for a school project and I wrote it like, I just remember writing it like in our half finished basement and it just like came out of me. And, you know, I had like a lot of feelings towards my sister because she was, whereas as a child, I was much more um, observant and like withheld shy yeah mm -hmm. I guess as well and and Ellie was very much like just threw herself into like situations and we had different dads and there's a lot of like just interesting dynamics and I had a lot of like fear of her just like be being better at everything you mm -hmm. know and um and she was like not a great toddler like she was actually really mean to me which is weird to say about like a yeah. two three-year-old but she <laughs> she was like mimicking different behaviors and she would like hit me and like basically like bully me in a way that if she was Older, closer to my age it would yeah. be like completely inappropriate yeah um so I it's it's interesting like that I wrote this song to be honest um but I also like did really love her. She gave me so many bloody noses. It's like actually oh, wow. now that I'm thinking about it, it's like appalling. <laughs> and um, <laughs> my mom obviously was like, oh my gosh, this is so cute. And so we put it on this pink iPod. I turned it in for a school project. The recording is like terrible. There's this huge buzz in it. And it was, I'd been playing classical music for a long time and studying classical voice and violin and piano but I didn't when you do like just classical you don't learn like jazz theory or mm -hmm. chords or anything so I was the chord structure of that song is actually really weird and interesting and I anyways so it, I wrote it and then that was done and then the pandemic hit and my sister was turning 18 and so and she still like listened to it sometimes which is really Aww. cute and it, it was like you had to have the iPod like plugged in or it wouldn't mm -hmm. turn on and so I found the iPod, <laughs> listened to the song, and I'm like, okay, it's COVID. There's, like, nothing else to do. So I should – it'd be really cool to, like, record a nice version, version of her. Version of this, yeah. And she's very musical. She's not, like – she doesn't really do music. She's a dancer. But she's got a lot of, like, innate musical talents. And she also, like, loves music. Mm. And she listens to – so many great artists and she's I'm very careful of who I send stuff to for feedback because mm -hmm. you know you, I think there's a point where you have to just like make your own decisions but she's one of those people that I I do ask for her opinion on because mm. I she knows what she's she knows what she likes and I I really respect her opinion and so I uh decided to yeah re-record this version and it happened like super naturally and I played it for her and at this point I was also getting ready to record my record mm -hmm. and I just like fell in love with the song again and I'm like it's so nice and beautiful yeah. and I really loved the protection that I that I put on it um and so when I came to Vancouver to record my record and I told the producer that I was working with Andy Schichter I was like I want to do this exactly like mm -hmm. I already recorded it, but I want to record it like properly because I did like the vocals in one take, the acoustic in one take. Mm -hmm. And um, what it ended up happening is that I re-recorded the vocals. We sped it up like a couple BPM. I recorded the acoustic and then we went to record the backing vocals. So we listened to like the original track so that I could 
match them. And then we were listening to it and I was like, we have to use the original vocal, not like the original vocal when I was 17, but like mm-hmm. the original vocal that I did, um, when I recorded during the pandemic. And so we ended up having to redo a lot of stuff to like match the BPM, but we used the original acoustic, the original vocal, and then just basically emulated the rest that I'd done. And, and my friend John Perry did uh, pedal steel on it, which I think really brings the song together. And I, I thought about it. I was like, why? What is better about it? Because, you know, I used a better mic, a better preamp. Mm. I took multiple takes. We'd edited it all. And the vocal sounded really good. But I think both the reason why the song is so special and why that that vocal that I ended up using on the record is so special is because I was it was just for her. Mm. Like I didn't I did end up using it for a school project, but it wasn't I didn't write it for a project. Mm-hmm. And I didn't I only recorded the vocal for her to hear for her birthday because I like love her and she's my sister. So you can't emulate that mm-hmm. in the studio. You can't You could have chosen to also do a different theme for your school project you know yeah so like that says a lot about like yeah yeah your intention yeah and I it's you know we there's so much music right now that's like very polished and produced and poppy and I love so much of it you know but I think more and more I'm really loving the imperfections and the emotion and the organicness of music where you can hear the artist behind it Mm -hmm. and I think that experience of of just recording that song and writing that song um just really showed me that like oh it doesn't have to be perfect Mm -hmm. and you know like listen I just saw Stevie Nicks a couple nights ago like Stevie Nicks Fleetwood Mac the band the Eagles like Mm -hmm. they're not perfectly in tune on their records like there's flubs and there's like but it's so good and timeless and like if they'd auto-tuned it or done a million takes like would it still be listened to constantly now? Mm-hmm. Or is it because we can he- feel them recording those? Because you can, f- yeah, you can listen to like humanity. Yeah. You know? And that's what we're connecting with. Yeah. We're not connecting with computers. A robot, yeah. An AI. Yeah. So um, anyways, that was a bit of a tangent, but. No, I, but it's <laughs> totally true. <laughs> and I did, I don't know if you saw it, but at last summer I uh, filmed a music video for that song um, yes with my sister and it's like us dancing and oh that was really like special and I think that's like my most viewed music video which is funny because like that one I I didn't do because I thought like oh this is a really good move or marketing move mm-hmm. and I just did it because I had some funding and I just was like that would be so special and yeah. so much fun to like bring it full circle mm-hmm. it's like have my sister and I do this thing to the song that I wrote for her like a while back and um and now you know partially for my mom too who <laughs> loves it obviously so. yeah that's so cute that's mm-hmm. really nice um yeah I'd probably yeah I guess that's uh things that I would do as well if I were a musician <laughs> um yeah and uh so you have like all these you had all these tours or yeah, like all these gigs and touring you did uh, this year. Um, what's next for like this year? You have you're gonna probably release something with Rumor Mill, yeah, very soon. Yeah, um, and you're gonna start touring uh, with her as well. Mm-hmm. Well, with yeah, um, and are you gonna do something else during this year as solo? Yeah, like a- yeah, I've got like. It's, I'm glad that we're, we're, we are where we are in the year because, um, yeah, just, oops, just getting back from Toronto. And then, um, in May I was touring in Europe for four weeks, um, solo. So all were such amazing experiences, but now it's nice. It's like, okay, there's like a few less things to think about. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this summer is, is, uh, kind of split between like touring solo. Um, and by solo, I, I mean like as myself, I often Mm -hmm. do perform with a band, which has been so much fun. And then with Rumor Mill as well. Mm -hmm. And going back to like what we were talking about, about like saying yes, um, it's, that's actually something I think about a lot. And I've actually started trying to say no more 
while like staying open, like I'm open to opportunities Mm -hmm. and if it serves me, I say yes, but then balancing it out, balancing it out. Yeah. And so like last year I just said yes to everything and I did, I played so many shows and this year it's like, okay, what shows are actually going to be beneficial? And I don't know if you've heard of like the triangle of, I don't know what it's called. It's not the triangle of sadness, but it's uh, (laughs) where like it either has to be like financially advantageous, Mm, um, really good for exposure or career or Mm -hmm. just a lot of fun. Mm. And if it's hitting two of those points, sometimes I'll say yes if it's just one, um, then saying yes. But like oftentimes looking at that and being like, okay, is it even hitting one of those points or is it just something that I feel like I should say yes to because I have really bad FOMO. Um, (laughs) So anyways, I'm really excited for like a lot of the shows that I have planned both solo and with Rumor Mill. Um, We are going to be releasing that record slowly like drip dropping singles over the next few months. Um, I'm going to Winnipeg in July to play a couple shows and then Rumor Mill, we are going back to Europe in November. Nice. And I'm going to be putting on a really fun show in Vancouver. I think at a recording studio later this year um, and doing kind of a a live show with my band, but then also videoing it mm. um, just to create some content and and just to put something together that's just like very curated and is going to be good because oftentimes you walk into situations and venues where like the sound isn't great or, you know, yeah, it ends up staining like, yeah. Your, yeah. So it's like, mm. so just to have like control over, over it and putting together something that feels really much more true, like targeted and driven yeah. And like just what I want, you know, and how I want to, how I want to put my show forward. Um, where are you going in Europe? <laughs> honestly, I, so I just toured Germany, Belgium, and Austria. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this tour, we kind of like told our agent like a little bit late. Mm. I've already like, he's already starting to book my tour like next spring. Um, and so I was just like, we're flying in, in and out of Amsterdam, like book us the best shows you can <laughs> in whatever countries that makes sense. So, so far, I think we have some in the Netherlands and in Poland. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, and I, it's, that's going to be, like, our first tour in Europe, and so, like, same with mine, like, I think a lot of, like, your first tour in Europe with whatever project is, you know, you want to follow, like, your statistics and stuff, but at this stage, it's kind of, like, just going with the flow, with the flow, yeah, and, like, you never know where it's going to lead to, and then when you go back, like, next year with my project, I have, like, more targeted countries and cities mm-hmm. that I want to, want to visit, but um, it's, every project, like, it resonates with people differently in different mm-hmm. areas. Um, so that's kind of what that's going to be like. Um, I'm also going to be recording a little bit of solo stuff with my band this year, putting that out next year. Perfect. It never stops. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, Cause you have, you have a French song actually. Oh uh, yeah. I just released that one. Yeah. yeah key. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is awesome. So hopefully you can also make a small detour into France. Maybe. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, <laughs> I spent a week in Paris at the end of my tour, like just, um, for fun with my mom and I would love to play. In that would Paris. be awesome. Yeah. Belgium was cool too, because in half of this, the country, they do speak French and yeah. I found. Angel is I uh, I don't know if you know Angel. She's a, well, Belgian pop singer, but she's oh. huge in Paris or in, in France in general. Um, yeah, all her songs are in French. She's like really. Cool. Yeah. I have heard of her actually. Somebody was telling me about her recently. Yeah, she's really. She her music is awesome. Cool. I'll take um, her. and her brother is a rapper as well. He got into a big mess oh, uh, with whole Me Too movement. Yeah, Great. but her music is like awesome. Okay. Um, and she has really cool videos. And yeah, you should definitely check her out. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. I will for sure. Yeah. I also think like French and like any of the Latin languages just sound so beautiful. Like yeah, being Spanish, like Spanish. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Not you know because I speak it, but yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. I I feel like you are a very busy woman, and I'm very thankful that you decided to come with us and sit here with us and chat about uh, your whole journey. Um, and I really, really, really uh, like hope the best for you and your career. 
Um, you're a very talented musician. Thank you. So hopefully we'll keep like having you here. Um, and if you want to leave uh, your social media, uh, your Patreon community as well. Um, yeah, all your social media tags and all of that. Yes, I will. It's really easy. It's basically just Anna Katarina music on everything. Um, a Anna with double N. Yeah, was, yeah. A N N A K A T A R I N A music. Um, I'm on like most platforms: YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. I mean, if you want to follow me, you can. I don't post. I actually like post on Twitter, and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get canceled, so I delete it. <laughs> but like canceled for saying something like, um, like. I get sick on the sky train riding backwards or something like I'm, yeah. I'm really like self-conscious about it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, um, and then, yeah, my Patreon is a really just nice, beautiful community and it's a really great way to support me and support artists. And I release like a lot of music that, you know, I will release eventually to the mm -hmm. public and videos. And I also just release stuff that I'll never release publicly there too. Um, for oh, example, awesome. the original version of For Ellie, um, once I can get it off that pink iPod, <laughs> <laughs> I might need a hacker. Uh, but yeah, like every follow on social media and Spotify, like it, I feel like musicians are always talking about it, but it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. And beyond just like the algorithm, like festivals look at that showcasing bookers look at that and it just shows that you know people believe in what we're doing and and it's pretty awesome awesome yeah. it was so nice having you it was here. so nice to be here thanks for the mezcal I'm, yeah, and the coffee you're welcome yeah um so we're gonna finish off with a nice cheers i'm not sure well, if you i think i have <laughs> i have a baby sip left okay i can i can pour you if you don't if you're not like <laughs> okay tiny one i'm not driving <laughs> i dropped most of it <laughs> it's for the cat cheers, cheers. thank cheers. you cheers